what's to come updates to the UE4 roadmap. Now, it was previously promised that we would have the roadmap updated by early April. It's late April, so thank you all for bearing with us as we're a little bit late on delivery on this one. But the update is done. It's on Trello. You can check out all of the things that are coming and the things that are in 416 preview. It's much more straightforward. It's much more succinct. We're not trying to predict as much far out, et cetera. It's more about showing you what we know is happening, what we know is really uh, locked down, et cetera. We want to really keep you in the loop on what we're doing and what's much more feasible. So check it out and also come down to the feedback for Epic section and give us your feedback on what you think of these changes and what you think of the things that are coming uh, down the road. Next up, the Mix LA. So uh, at E3, there's this thing called the Mix LA. You might not be aware of it, and we wanted to bring your attention to it because it's pretty neat. Uh, for one, it's kind of an indie showcase, and it's kind of neat. So if, you've, if you're familiar with E3, and you should be if you're watching anything here, so you're familiar that it's big, it's got a lot of big AAA company names, big AAA titles. It can be kind of like a big powerhouse. People can kind of um, get intimidated by it. But they're doing a lot to reach out to indies, and so Mix LA is kind of like an opportunity for that. Please check out their website here. Uh, this is uh, MediaIndieExchange.com, and they've got much more details about everything that they're doing. Uh, please take a look. You know, you might recognize some UE4 friends in there. Next up, we have some spot. Uh, sorry, we have some showcases. <laughs> so showcases here. This one's by Brian Rowe. Uh, this is for Earthfall. If you're not familiar with Earthfall, it's a really cool, fast-paced shooter game made in UE4. We have some developer interviews going on here, and Earthfall is more or less it's got a lot of inspiration from um left for dead you know it's it's a team based you're fighting against waves of different monsters as you try to move from one side of the city to the other but they're aliens from space it's kind of post-apocalyptic y and oh hello blink project interesting uh, i just decided to pop in and say hi uh, <laughs> i'm building a couple things in the background i apologize for that so Anyway, if uh, you want to check these out, it's a good behind-the-scenes look, give you some advice from other game developers that are making something in Unreal, and so you can see what they're doing. Also, the screenshots are pretty rad. I, I like these monsters a lot. Next up, Steel Hunter is another one of the spotlight items on here, or uh, showcase items, I should say, showcase, uh, um, done by Jeremy Peel. Uh, it's a really interesting interview with Trent Pollock. Thank you again, Blank Project. It's good to see you, my friend. <laughs> so Trent, uh, I actually got to bump into a GDC for all of like five minutes. Um, and uh, he's been working on Steel Hunters. Really cool. If you like Mech Warrior kind of things, it's a lot of that in there. But he goes into full de uh, detail about systems that he's built, how he's built out, like the construction, et cetera. Um, and, and actually, I've talked to him previously online, and he says he's like, I'm a system programmer. That's like what I want to be. So check out the systems that he's built. Check out how he's built everything. And there's uh, some pretty good some pretty good quotes in here. Um, and yeah, it's just a good uh, interview of the Joy Machine crew, which is an army of one. <laughs> so those are our news items of the day. I'm going to go ahead and close off of that. And next up. Uh, Oh no. Oh, so um, a quick apology here. We're going to have to do a, a little bit of a reset. It seems that YouTube isn't going out properly. So after I get done with this section, we're going to fix one thing really fast, and then we'll get right into the blueprints and uh, the editor and talking about blueprint nativization. So let's hop into our uh, top karma earners of the week. At answers.unrealengine.com, we have questions and answers. People can help each other out. It's also where you can make bug reports. But if people come in here and actually um, try to help work through problems, they can get karma points by getting upvotes and little thumb ups, you know. And then those accumulate into your weekly karma points, where we take the past seven days, it accumulates, and you get on this high scoreboard. So this week, we've got Binergy. Thank you so much. These top three here are going to be getting um, badges on the forums. And if they already have the badges, then once they are on here three times, they get a special badge. So Binergy, you've been on here a few times. I don't even know, but I think you might have the specialty badge at this point. Scott Spadia, uh, again, a regular. Van Lack, you're a new regular, but I've been seeing you a lot. Moss, hey, buddy. <laughs> no Moss. Um, Nullbot, uh, Motoshi, uh, oh, sorry, Moriyoshi-san. Uh, Moriyoshi-san, thank you so much. Add no, uh, Miroic, Miroic, I think I got that one right. Robo Scorpion, 
MK Studio, thank you all so much for helping out your fellow developers. And for those of you who didn't make it on the board, better luck next time. And please keep helping each other out. I'd love to be giving your name a shout out on here too. Do -do. Now we have our community spotlights. So community spotlights are things that you've sent me or things that I found while searching around in the community of things that you guys are making, things that I thought were cool. And uh, we put them up on the launcher and we show them off here on the stream. This is visual refactoring by Hippo Wombat. Uh, woo, I had some notes over here, but it got vanished real fast. So, um, visual refactoring was done by Christian Sparks, who was Hippo Wombat. You might recognize the name off of uh, forums, etc. And also, I uh, run Small Heart Studios, who was our sponsor for the UE4 Jam for Spring, uh, one of them. And thank you so much for that, by the way. And so he's got this really cool blog going on here about using a cell shader in order to create this kind of Legend of Zelda style shader. Uh, it's just a nice background breakdown. You got a nice uh, animated, uh, animated GIF here. I'm just going to show you. See this? It's very windy, like Legend of Zelda scene. Uh, it goes into the background of why he did it, how it was done, and also um, kind of leads into our next spotlight. This is just really nice breakdown of tons of details how it was made. But this link here became the next spotlight because I was really impressed with it. So next uh, spotlight item is um, Thuru. I assume that's how you pronounce that username, Thurau, uh, has made semi cell shade post process material tutorial. And it's here on the forums. It's really cool. It's very in depth. It goes into tons of detail and shows off lots of examples of how it works. You can do it yourself, build your own, extrapolate from it, uh, and take all these details that are provided here and kind of figure out how you might want to make alterations. And then um, it's kind of like a, a two part discovery because it was like, uh, Hippo Wombat sent me some stuff, and I thought, oh, that was cool, and then realized that what he was sending me led back to a tutorial that was also awesome. So just want to share both those pieces for you. And if you out there wrote a cool tutorial or uh, followed a really interesting tutorial, built some really interesting assets out of it, and then wrote a blog about going through that, please send them my way. I'd love to be spotlighting you as well. That's what these are for, is to highlight the things you're doing in the community. Um, last thing here. Uh, Staffordshire University student games. So Showster, who was one of our beta participants, but it looks like they've been pretty quiet lately based on these uh, post counts. Um, but Showster showed up and showed off a ton of awesome games. So I'm going to just encourage you all to come out here to the release project section of the forums. Check out the Staffordshire. Staffordshire. I, I, Shelley tried to convince me it's Staffordshire or something, but it, I'm pretty sure Staffordshire is correct. So you, uh, you want to come out here, check out these games. They're gorgeous student games, very well made. Look at this, it's just so gorgeous. A lot of fun. Um, they're cute, very polished, and <laughs> generally very silly. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much to the whole crew for posting these out here. Hey, this one's fun. You get to break down walls, sledgehammer stuff. Uh, it's just very cool to see what students are up to and to see the student projects can be something of you know to actually be very impressed with here and uh, here's their their page about the epic Games center for staffordshire university which i must admit i didn't even realize was uh, a thing we were doing but it's visiting professor mike gamble it's mike gamble he's he's our buddy i didn't <laughs> i don't know how i didn't know about this one but it's really awesome um and uh, just wanted to say again, thanks to Mike and the whole team over there for, for getting these posted up. Very cool little projects. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna take a second to try to fix um, OBS. Clint, all good? We're gonna go dark for one second and then we're gonna come back up. I apologize everybody, but we're gonna be just fine in a sec. All right, and we're back. Um, hey Mike, <laughs> sorry about that. Look, we had to drop out for a second. Hey. Yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, YouTube is not working with us today. We've, we've tried a bunch of stuff over here for a second. We thought that we could make a couple swaps and fix it, but uh, it's just not happening. But we're going to keep going so that we can get this out here, and then the archive can be on YouTube. I'm so sorry to my folks out there at YouTube. You, you're still my friends. I'm <laughs> not trying to leave you out there. But uh, Mike, there you are, buddy. Do we have audio? We Hello. Yes, we do. Hi. All right. So yes, Mike, thank you so much for coming out today to talk about blueprint nativization. Um, so uh, you've made a, a, some content here that uh, I'm going to kind of fly around and you, you tell me what to do and tell me what we're uh, taking a look at here. Yeah. So uh, before we get into this, I want to give props where they're due. Oh, yeah. um, I want to say that nativization has been a feature that uh, 
a programmer, one of our programmers out of Poland, Maciek Mroz, has been working on for over a year. So this is, this is really his baby uh, that he saw come to life. So that's what we're demonstrating right here. Um, with that, uh, I, you asked me to do this live stream, and I was like, how can I show off something that is going to be, like, that is supposed to happen behind the scenes? So I threw together a little demo that's pretty simple that I handed to you. And basically, what it has is it has uh, two blueprints that are the same. And uh, they, one's been nativized and one hasn't. And I'm just doing a bunch of math in it and causing, purposely causing some hitches and showing off the timing and how, fa how much faster the nativization one is. So um, if you jump into it right now, I can show you that. Cool. So, uh, so I, I kind of hijacked our content examples uh, project and just have like three blueprints at like three stations. And basically, what you see in front of you is uh, the timer. The important thing is the timer in the top left is going to be timing uh, the time that, not the, the ticks that it's running, but what, what it's actually doing and processing. So as you step into it, you kind of see this iterations pops up and it. It's basically looping over something 20,000 times and doing some math. Um, and the math I actually pulled from one of our community members who discovered uh, discovered nativization early on when it was experimental. Uh, John Alcatraz kind of gave us some early numbers on it and said it worked out for him. And so I'm doing the same thing he was doing in this blueprint. So oh, that's very cool. Walk, yeah. If you uh, walk up to that switch right there, it's going to. Oh. Do some math, and then it's going to hitch. Yeah, you can definitely feel that hitch. You can step back and do it again, um, and see. There's the hitch, and there, there we go. And so, I, I like my visualization showing its processing of like throwing some ones and zeros on there. <laughs> I was like, how do you visualize uh, it doing something? So that's the non-nativized version, and it took like a second plus the hitch, uh, or yeah. And so here's the nativized version, exact same blueprint, duplicated, nativized, same iterations. And if you walk up to that guy, you can see there's still going to be a slight hitch. Uh, the reason why I added a hitch in, actually, is because it was so fast uh, that I was questioning my time. <laughs> like it, it was reporting back as like zero to me uh, with the timing because it was so minuscule compared to what it was. Um, so so that, that little hitch that we're still experiencing there, you still injected that because you wanted it to show off what it would look like. I, I wanted it to show some noticeable amount of time on the timer. Uh, so it's still, it's still hitching because it's a ridiculously stupid algorithm, I'll tell you that. <laughs> like we're basically iterating over uh, an array of... <clears throat> 20,000 things and doing a find on each in that array. So it's it's really slow and really stupid. Um, but you can see, like, we cut that down to, to milliseconds. Yeah. And even you can you can disable the hitch if you're in that uh, thing. If you hit key, it will toggle it on and off. Like, there's a little visualization in the lower left. Um, Wait, it's a, it's a what? So hit T, the, you oh, see that where it's under. Underneath where it says total iterations, there's a hitch. Like oh. it should say hitch yes or no, and that will say whether you want it to hitch or not. Oh, and so wow. There, that's without the hitch, and that's what I was getting. Like basically, and you can go turn off the hitch in the other one and see how much time it's taking, as well. Oh. So you can mess around with it and turn up the iterations, like so. All right. Um, but basically, it's showing off how much faster nativization is. Like, uh, I mean, if you're doing stupid code, it's still going to be like slow in C++, but uh, that's the hitch. But basically, we removed all the overhead here uh, that is going in and out of the, the blueprint nodes. Uh, the last one on the end is like a point that I wanted to make, and we can get into this a little later, <clears throat> is that uh, blueprints are still perfectly viable for for building projects around and making entire games out of. And you you don't need to prematurely optimize, I should say. Like this is this is kind of to help you along and make optimizing easier. But this guy is the same blueprint, just doing way less work. Like his iterations you'll see are, are way less. And he's not doing like arguably it's still like kind of slow on the scale of one blueprint, but for the sake of this demo, it is not nearly causing the hitch that the other ones are. So, 
Um, my point is basically like you want to probably figure out what your problematic blueprints are before, and you can directly target those with nativization. Cool. Uh, what is the and so the hitching here is just kind of unlocking and locking in that larger chunk, but it wasn't. It's not too bad in this version, is what you're saying? Yeah, this is not nativized right here. Yeah. So like if you compare this, like it's st it's still hitch because we're doing things, but like it's not taking that second long hitch that the other one is. Um, so comparatively, if you're looking at this, and and I actually have like a, I don't know if you want to open that up in the editor, but I I gave you a stats file where we can like basically look at these two compared to each other, and that's how I figured it. Like you want to do that if you're just targeting specific blueprints, you want to take a stats capture and look at which which blueprints are actually your problematic ones, and start with nativizing those and seeing how how. Uh, how much it helps your game oh sure yeah you want to walk me through that yeah sure so well well I would like the capture I have already for you so if you mm -hmm. go over you have the editor open let's see here now I have uh, I have a build of 416 over here just gonna yeah, uh, quit it's... out of here is fine yeah right. that's pretty much the demo um... <clears throat> let's see here yeah so I have uh, I have this project you want me to, to open up that one then yeah, let's start a blank project. We can nativize some things after you kind of open up this uh, stats capture and I kind of show you what I was seeing. All um, right, very cool. And uh, and so you this came from, uh, you said that that math came from John Alcatraz? Uh, the math, yeah, like basically a while ago he made a post that was uh, back when we first kind of introduced nativization as an experimental feature, he was uh, he made a post in the forums that was basically talking about how uh, helpful it was and the numbers that he was seeing. Uh, and he threw together just like a, a bunch of math and slow iterations, kind of like what I was doing. Oh, wow. And yeah, he, he's been in our community for a long time. Like, like I've seen him around a lot, so that's cool. Yeah, I definitely know the name around here. <laughs> um, so if you go to Window, Let's open up the stats viewer first. Um, go to the developer tools and, and see here. go down to session front end. There it is. Uh, go over to the profiler tab and load. All right. Navigate to that folder that I had. Uh, go up to the nativization demo up one. There you go. And that one file that's at the bottom of the list there. All righty. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So this is a small step. And already you see, like, there's a spike right there. Mm -hmm. And then the, I'm, like, pointing as if it matters. Right there. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a spike. And if you actually, in the search stat groups to the left, that search window, um, oh, that's down, right. there, down. There it is. Yep. Go, type in blueprint time. So this is the generic that that kind of wraps all the like blueprint time that's invoking double click on that guy oh, and that's yeah. so you can see that that coincides with that uh with that uh spike right there as well so you can say see there's a spike on the game thread and you're like okay what was that spike and you see that a blueprint is definitely causing that spike so this is kind of like when you're choosing what you want to nativize and what you don't want to nativize, this can help identify those things. And so if you like scroll, go down to the event list, and we're going to dive in just really quick. All right, let me adjust this. Yeah, so game thread, and just kind of keep expanding the like top item of game thread. It's down there. No, that's yeah, audio Yeah, game thread, thread yeah. frame thread. Yeah, frame time. Frame time. Game engines. So this is all the kind of like functions that it takes down to get to and I had it set up to a key when I press this to take this capture so like it's ticking tick input it's getting the input yeah, there's your function stress test so if you look so these two things so there's blueprint time and you can stop expanding it and there blueprint time and then there's one below so above blueprint time that identifies the blueprint that it was so if you look to the next item at that level this one there's no, it's collapse the collapse the oh. there that guy right there. So. No, down one more. Ah, there we go. So that's the less iterations one. That's the one that we were at the last station, and they were happening at the same time. So you can see that yeah, if you expand the less iterations, the one that's BP underscore less iterations. Mm. 
So comparatively, like you see that one is way worse. Yeah, you can so see the millisecond the tick there. So this is all I was trying to prove with that is basically if you're doing kind of uh, choosing blueprints to, to nativize, uh, you definitely come in here, use our stats tool to your advantage, and this can easily help you identify uh, which blueprints uh, you want to, to start targeting. So, um, with that said, we can close that. Okay. I can walk you through how to nativize something. Cool, let's nativize a thing. Yeah. So, let's just make a blueprint uh, the easiest way. What do you Let's make an actor print? All righty. Test native. There we go. So now we got we got us an actor. And we want to let's add something that we can recognize in source code. So like maybe add a function. Oh, all right. Let's uh let's just add some kind of function here. Um, big old test function. Yeah. There we go. Big old test function. Yeah, make it do some stuff, maybe some math, like drag off of that, and, uh, print, do a print string. That's always my go-to do stuff. <laughs> it's it's very much so the, a good way to do it. Uh, let's let's do a um, uh, let's do like a float to string kind of thing here, because one way or the other we're gonna need we're gonna need that, and then I'm just gonna crank out some math of some sort. Uh, I don't know what's a, what's a, what's some good suggestions for for throwing some math in here? Cause, uh, yeah, just do some ads or something like that. Just Maybe, uh, float, float, yeah, like maybe a vector multiplied by a vector. Let's do here. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to get too complicated. We're not going to do the crazy intense stuff that we we got there. Just something that we can recognize. Um, just throwing some. I'm just throwing in numbers. These are all made up numbers. I'm. I'm just. How about you add like add a variable to like just so that we can see that like add a variable a float variable to the class. And then we can see that guy. Doesn't matter if it's local, does it? I didn't. I wouldn't think so. Do one of each. Cool. I'm down with that. All right. We're gonna promote to variable. Test two. Cool. And then compile. I'm gonna set their defaults to something crazy. This can be like 500. I don't know. Just making stuff up. Oh, it does inherit whatever it was it was derived from too. But whatever. Just making it up. There we go. There's there's some math. You want me to make this bigger? No, oh, that's fine. All right, cool. I think I'll let me do crazy. Uh, so the reason why math is a good uh, math is a really good candidate for for nativization and optimizing because basically what you're doing is you're removing the overhead. Every one of our nodes has some overhead associated with it. So like most of our nodes are C plus plus function calls and what we do is we push all those variables that go into that node function call onto a stack, and then there's some overhead that's pulling them off the stack when we need to call the C++ function. So we're basically removing the need for all of that uh, when we nativize this stuff and make it so that it can just do a plain, like an add or a multiply and stuff like that directly in there. All right, cool. Uh, so what's the next so, step then? Uh, let's, let's actually call this function in tick just so that it does something. All righty, let's begin play. There's tick. Da, 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 big old test function. Woo. All right, every tick, we're going to be printing a string. We're going to print some maps. Yep. Um, let's see here. You probably want to oh. drop <laughs> it in the bubble. <laughs> Helps if I actually add it to the scene. There we go. Professionalism. There we go. Yep, so it's just going to keep cranking that same number out because it's not got any variables in there or anything. Or, so it doesn't have anything that's dynamically changing. Yeah, um, that's fine. We just kind of want to show off nativization. So mm -hmm. the easiest way to nativize, basically, is if you go into class settings on your blueprint, there, that button at the top, uh -huh. there is a underneath packaging, there is a checkbox called nativize. And you check that. Bam. <laughs> so what that did, also behind the scenes. Wow, that's so awesome. That flagged, it flagged this blueprint for nativization. Um, but what that did behind the scenes, if you go back to your project settings, like if you uh, go to file, yeah, project settings, and under packaging. Packaging, there we go. Uh, if you scroll down, there's a blueprint section now in here. Uh, and uh, it, there's a blueprint nativization method. And so if you drop down the, uh, drop down the like, 
expand. Oh, wait, we forgot to save. So save that blueprint. We didn't save with the nativization setting. Oh, very important to save. Got it. Yeah. OK. So now if you uh, expand, there's the added, uh, there's the arrow down below. Not that one right there. We'll get to that in the a second. The there's, advanced setting. Yeah. yeah. So there's an element that's been added to that list of like target blueprints. And there's our test native blueprint. And it added it to this list of, of targets to nativize. Uh, Clint, can we just uh, zoom in on this bottom part a little bit as we're talking about it? It's just a little bit small. Um, so keep going. No worries. Um, yeah, stop me if I'm talking too much. No, no, you're um, good. I just wanted to knock me out of the picture so we could get a little bit more resolution. Um, so yeah, so you basically have that blueprint for targeted for nativization, and you have this nativization method, which is currently disabled. Um, so you can flip that to, and there's inclusive and exclusive. And inclusive is going to nativize it for all blueprints like in your project. So uh, it doesn't really matter that you targeted that specific blueprint, but it would uh, nativize everything in your project. Um, and that's good for smaller projects. The problem is uh, it adds a lot of code to your projects and can grow your executable size. Um, so that's why I was kind of uh, pointing towards, you probably want to target some blueprints that need nativization first before doing the whole project. The whole project is a good test to see like how much performance you can get out of it. So uh, like exclusive nativization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, click, click on it, select it. All right. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So we are now set up to nativize when we package. Um, and if you go back to your project, so settings are saved when you like file drop down and let's package this guy. All right, let's do it. Uh, 64 bit or 32 bit? What do you think? I'm in 64 bit. Seems safe. We're not living in the past. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, uh, let's see here. I'm going to make a new one here. Um, I'm just going to make a folder to keep this in so it doesn't get too crazy. Uh, native. All right, selecting that folder. Cool. So that's packaging. Uh, yeah, hopefully that works. But uh, so what it's doing behind the scenes, so. This hooks into the normal cook process. So when we're like cooking all the assets for uh, the package build, uh, it looks at blueprints and it says, do you need to be nativized? And if you need to be nativized, let's not save the U asset file. Let's instead generate a C++ file. And those C++ files get added into a, a plugin that gets uh, compiled in with the build uh, step. Of, of that. So you can see right there, we already have like test native underscore PF. And there's this magic number that we tack on on the end as a unique identifier. Go down a little bit. There you go. In the middle there. Up, up, up. Uh, but, oh, wait, there it is. Yeah, I see it. Uh, yeah. It was a little so bit hard to see. That uh, it generated. So it's compiling in our, our uh, CPP file. So it's already gone through the cook process. So we can actually go look at this on disk, like look at the files that it generated. All right. So go to where your project, like where you saved your project at. All right. I think that one is, oh, ha. That's going to be back over here on oops, users, me. And then I think I have a projects perforce. Nope. It must be on the D drive. Yep. Unreal project. There it is. Native. Windows no editor. There we go. Okay, click on my project, uh, the folder, sorry. Oh, yep. Not launch back into ourselves. Open that guy up. Uh -huh. Oh, wait, is this where we packaged it to? Yes. Oh, I want to go to where the U project actually is on disk. Oh, okay, yeah, um, that's just my project. There you go. Okay, and then go into intermediate. If you click in the intermediate folder, mm -hmm. uh, plugins, Windows no editor. Nativized assets and sort like source. so. This is the plugin that was generated behind the scenes by nativization, and so it's awesome because we generated a plugin. It made it really easy to hook into the build process. We just basically say, here's an extra plugin to build with with your game, 
and that's how it works. And so if you click on source, keep going, like go to public. There we go. There's our like test native pf.h or whatever. You can open up that guy if you have a. Yeah, it should be able to just boop. <laughs> text file should be fine. Hi, Visual Studio. Uh, no, no, maybe later. Sure, dark. Start Visual Studio. <laughs> How we get to install? Yeah, I reinstalled the uh, reinstalled it this morning, so now it's like you've never used Visual Studio. I'm like, ah, I used you yesterday. There we go. There we go. There we go. And it's, I mean, it's not the prettiest thing. I wouldn't write code like this, but it's <laughs> it's <laughs> technically right. correct, the best yeah. kind of correct. <laughs> the reason why, like, you see special names, like we have to account for wacky characters and all the stuff that we allow for in, in blueprints that isn't allowed in normal C++ and things like that. But look in here at the bottom of that list, there's big old test function right there. Um, and actually, if you go back to disk, I had you open the header file. Um, go back to where we opened this source file from. Go, yeah, to private. Open up that, that guy right there. Please open in the same instance. You you did 2017. There yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to. There we go. Uh huh. Uh, we searched this file for big old test function or whatever you called it. Oh my, the includes. Yes, there we yeah. go. Yeah, blueprints depend on a lot more than you. <laughs> you're very surprised when you uh, start pulling in all the stuff that you uh, depend on. Yeah, so it was. Oh uh, yeah, big old. There you go. Big old test function. That's where we call it. Scroll uh -huh. down a little further. That's where we. Yep. There's all the multiplies. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And so a lot of people, a lot of programmers are freaking out right now because they're seeing these multiply float, and they're like, "Why don't you just do an actual multiply? Why is it still a function call?" So that's because of the way that our backend VM works for for blueprints, but we inline all this stuff, so it's just going to be equivalent to uh, a float multiplication and whatnot. So, um, so that's the code that generated from our stuff. Someone asked me once if uh, they could learn C++ programming through this, and I told them, please, please don't. Uh, <laughs> it's it's like a robot wrote code. So. Uh... Wow. Um, all right. Cool. I mean, that's the basic gist of the process. Do you have any? specific questions oh yeah I... yeah we've got we've got some questions out of chat we can uh, we can take a whack at right here um, let's see uh, is there a blueprint to C++ tool for editing before cooking planned oh yeah any any uh, concepts as far as like before going out to cook and just kind of saying you nativize now while I'm an editor and then let me go into code so there is an I and I setting um, I actually have it here on the side um, and it lets you, it adds to a developer menu that I believe is only in the editor if you build from Visual Studio. It adds a option to generate the C++ for a, a specific blueprint that you're in. Um, and that we use for development purposes. Uh, it, it's not like that. It's not like you can generate C++ and then compile it on the fly for Pi or anything like that. The C++ will only be compiled in the final project uh, or in the package project, but you can test and look at the, the C++ that will be generated. And let me look at what. That's got to be very that's... exciting for the people asking. Yeah, that was yeah, a question from so... Raildex, by the way. Thank you, buddy. You're always out here now. Thank you for becoming a regular. Um... Yeah, I don't know why we have this on an INI setting. We should probably just enable it by default. But if you are in an I, in your engine INI file, uh, underneath the Kismet uh, section, there is a B nativize code generation tool. If you set that equal to true, uh, then you'll have the menu item in file uh, developer generate generate native code in the Blueprint editor. And that will help you. And that will pop up the code in Visual Studio after it's done generating and everything like that. Cool. Um, let's see here. Um, Durzo asks, would it take less time if you just made the, um, oh wait, if you make the same blueprint but it's C++ to begin with? Um, I guess that just depends on the size of the, of the blueprint and the size of the code that's behind it. 
Uh, in this instance, it probably would have just been faster because it was so <laughs> so little that we added in there. If you're already pretty fast at typing, but yeah, I can go over the. This kind of leads into what the inspiration for this, like us working on this, uh, was initially. And so, we we had it was at the time of of Paragon. And we had a bunch of blueprints that were still like kind of prototypey blueprints, and they weren't optimized for full game. And we were we were wanting to build towards the game pretty quickly. And so we saw this opportunity of like, well, people are converting. They were going after the low hanging fruit. We know there's overhead in blueprints. Let's convert them by hand to to uh, C plus plus. And that was uh, well disheartening. Uh, being a blueprints programmer. Uh, seeing them have to do that. So we wanted to add in this ability for them to just kind of, you can still write in blueprints, don't have to worry about it, like kind of with your packaging, when you package your game, generate it into C++ and you'll get, you'll get the performance boost so you don't have to do all that extra work by hand. All right, that's cool. I, I didn't even realize that this was a kind of birthed out of uh, Paragon needs. It's kind of a little backstory yeah, for we you. Didn't, we didn't end up I mean, it, it ended up taking a lot longer to work on than, than Paragon, the time frame, but it kind of burst out of like a performance push for, for Paragon. That's really awesome. I've had a lot of people ask me, how do we kind of decide what like new features get into the engine? And yeah, one of the major things is we made a game, the game needed it, and that's how we kind of got it. And sometimes, yeah, <laughs> things like this happen where it's like, well, didn't make it in time, but we still made it, so it was awesome, decided to add it anyway. Uh, yeah, it ended up actually being used in Robo Recall. Like we did the full, uh, full project nativization, and it ironed out. It, it's especially important in VR um, because hitches are more devastating in VR, especially when you're trying to run at a higher frame rate. Oh, and yeah. so uh, nativization just ironed it out smooth for them um, in that without them having to worry about it. Because it was birthed out of Bullet Train, which was a, a blueprint-only project. So, Wow. I. I am actually like uh, we we did the one about optimizing before, and it was really and that's actually kind of what birthed uh, this one as well. Where we're like, okay, well, once we follow up on that, we have to do the blueprint nativization one because that's like you know it was a big help. But uh, I'm going to recommend people to go check out that uh, optimization stream also if they want to learn more about other techniques that we used. Um, we have a few people asking kind of similar questions here, so I'm going to kind of mash this all into one. Uh, so it's uh, why or why should you not nativize? everything you kind of touched on this a little bit but when is it a bad idea to and why should you not nativize a blueprint so when you nativize a blueprint you are basically you're you're adding code that's going to be compiled into your your monolithic exe and so the problem with that is is you're adding like all your all your strings in blueprints are getting now hard coded into a c++ file as strings and that blows the executable size and is going to have an impact on like memory. If you're not worried about that stuff, like for Robo Recall, we were on PCs. We knew the specs of our PCs. We weren't worried about that. But for games like uh, Paragon that are going to be continually shipping like uh, uh, content like over the lifetime of the entire like thing, like it's just going to. If we were always cons consistently nativizing those, it would like grow and grow and grow and grow and grow the executable. Mm. So basically, you like for example, we don't nativize uh, uh, data-only blueprints, because there is no script code uh, in data-only blueprints. So there would be no benefit, and it would only be detrimental, because you'd be adding into your like executable size. So, so that, that's kind of when you want to think about that stuff. If you're constrained on memory and constrained on executable size, uh, then only do it uh, for what's needed. Uh, and I mean, I, I believe in optimize don't prematurely optimize optimize what you need to <laughs> yeah that's uh that's always been the first piece of advice that i've heard developers say um to anybody is always uh begin with optimization in mind start as low as possible and then as you work your way up keep trying to keep it low uh, so that's yeah. that's pretty good and it, it does sound like ultimately the advice is uh, this is a bloat trade-off where you're, you're trading off like bloat size of the executable and if that's okay then it's fine to to make like these smaller and smaller blueprints uh, into code 
but it seems that you should target the most functionally complex ones, the ones that are, are running the most often with the most complexity. Uh, that's where you're gonna save the most, which leads us into our next question, um, which is how much performance can you get by nativizing your blueprints? And I guess, give me a best case and a worst case scenario. Like how mu uh, what was the best you've ever seen and what was like a, a case where it went like backwards? Oh geez. Uh, so when we first decided to do this, um, I measured VM overhead, and that's kind of just the time spent unpacking those, and unpacking like the parameters and making the calls into uh, uh, the C++ func functions that they wrap. And that blueprint that was executing was like 90% VM overhead of its time. So it was pretty crazy. Like that's one of the reasons why we decided to go with this, is because you can potentially get rid of 90% of, of your execution time. The, pro, the, the real answer is it's going to depend on what you're doing in that blueprint. And that's why I am also urging like you, you want to profile your stuff. Uh, like I said, it's going to scale by the number of nodes that you're doing. If those nodes just wrap one function that is already written in C++, and that function does crazy complex stuff, then you're already, if you nativize, it's still going to be calling that function that's doing crazy complex stuff. So hmm. um, yeah, so like upwards of 90% 90, 90 is ridiculous, right? Like of your execution time. Um, uh, that was a very special blueprint. But that's so. good. That's good. Like that's, I mean, that's an extreme. It's an extreme, but it's an example of, of how much you could. Uh, I mean, in the demo there, we saw it, saw it go down from like a second to like a one millisecond was it? Yeah, so that kind of gives you idea. Yeah, and, the order of magnitude. And uh, and what was uh, and what was an example of it kind of going sideways? Going sideways, yeah. like, I mean, you mean going sideways in the way of like? Uh, oh, oh, you uh, you nativized and then it just blew up something and it didn't help at all. Yeah. So, for example, uh, animation blueprints. Um, We've nativized a couple of those that weren't doing a lot of stuff in them. The animation graph is its own special separate thing. So it doesn't, when you nativize, it doesn't, it doesn't, there isn't been any benefit to the animation graph specifically because it is stored as a uh, graph in nodes still. So basically, if you're not doing any other thing, anything out of an animation uh, graph in an animation blueprint, there's not really any benefit there. So it kind of just blew up the, uh, the executable size. Hey, that's yeah. good to know. I, I actually wouldn't have assumed that uh, animation uh, anim BPs would behave kind of differently, but I guess because they're attached to the anim graph and like the whole like state machine system. Yeah. All the all the like if you create like other graphs and normal functions like that are akin to those in in a regular standard blueprint, then those will still nativize in the same way. But okay, uh, animation graphs are processed differently than everything else. So. That's really good. Um, let's see here. Uh, we've got one more question. We're a little bit tight on time today just because uh, we normally have some time to go over, but we're, we have some things coming up. But we're going we're gonna to knock out one more question before we go today. Uh, Comrade Head Claude is asking, will blueprint nativization help with performance on the client in multiplayer games? I'm just going to expand on that. Is, does this affect multiplayer in any particular way or replication in any way that we should be aware of? And oh, uh, someone Wait. else asked about behavior trees, but I'll, I'll let you get, uh, get to that one first. Um, so no, not that I know of. Like uh, we've we've tested it with just like, for example, it didn't make sense for because uh, of bloat reasons on the client, but we wanted to nativize uh, the server, so we nativized just the server and had it working that way, and vice versa should work as well. So there's there's no real concerns there. Um, it boils down to the same kind of replication code. And, uh, and and this doesn't affect behavior trees at all, but does it affect um, behavior tree tasks and um, those kind of uh, blueprint, uh, I'm trying to think of, it, I guess, blueprint wrappers? Um, so I'm not too familiar with uh, behavior trees and the tasks that come with them. Uh, basically, standard blueprints, if it's a blueprint and has nativization checkbox in it, then it can be nativized. I don't know how that interacts with the your tree system. Mm -hmm. Basically, we like shim in like anything that would be referencing the blueprint class. We put in a shim that's basically like, here's your new nativized class. Replace it with that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so um, 
most likely because it is just kind of like a, a one of the more basic uh, blueprint classes. It might have that already in there. And then I would assume yeah. that, I'd, I'd assume that if you have a very complex uh, task that you're running or a very complex service you're running, it's probably good to try to nativize that after a while. So, yep. um, all right. Uh, that's all the questions that we're getting in for now, and we're it's perfect timing anyway because we got to keep moving and going to the next thing. But Mike, thank you so much for providing me with this awesome demo example and uh, you know show, walking me through how to do it myself and showing everybody how to nativize too and going through the history and background there. Um, it it means a lot to us that you carve out time in your day to come out and say hi. Uh, but no um, we're gonna uh, see you all later. Um, make sure that if you're watching us on well. Unfortunately, this one's not on YouTube yet, but it'll be on the archive. But if you're watching us on Facebook, Twitch, et cetera, um, hit like, follow, subscribe, all the different little buttons that are around you. And uh, make sure you're following us on Twitter and Facebook. And and hi, buddy. <laughs> you could get a, yeah, there you go. And, uh, and here we go. We're going to give a high five, and then we'll see you all later. Boop. <laughs> <laughs>